after the light of God. After the light of God. There is no law, substance, revelation, understanding, knowledge, wisdom that follows except love. Praise the Lord. Can I say it again? After the life of God is away, there is no revelation, there is no knowledge, there is no wisdom, there is no understanding, there is no law that follows except the law of love. It is this thing that is so close to the life of God that many people, if you wonder, if you try to preach it, and I'll tell you the truth, many of I've been in the body of Christ, and I'll tell you. Many of the things people preached in church called love were coming. They were coming. And I'm going to prove it in a few minutes. After this service, you will prove that they were coming. And because that was a carnal understanding of our relationships with God and what human beings used to do to get God to approve them and love them and, and to find themselves accepted and pleasing to God, the consequence of that was many Christians are not in a personal relationship with God. You have many Christians who attend service. You have many Christians who pray. You have many Christians who fast. You have many Christians who tithe. You have many Christians who sow seeds. You have many Christians who are in ministry. You have many Christians who are worshiping and praying and playing the pianos and guitar and even preaching. But I'll tell you the truth. I'm about to prove to you that many people do not have a relationship with God. Even though they are Christian, they are not in love. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, because I'm going to define it right from the end to, to, to the end of it, I, I the Spirit told me to take another approach. Okay? Because, and I'll explain why I'm taking this approach. This is what the Lord told me. When you read the New Testament, okay, many of you will realize that William Tyndale, King G. King James, he never translated it as love. He always called it charity. You understand? And the reason that's why he called it charity. The Bible tells you that the Jews seek, but the Greeks seek after the wisdom. Anything that has to relate to the ministration of the Jews and their relationship with the divine being will always be fine. And anything that seeks ministration of the same to the divine power to the Greeks will always be wisdom. You understand? And because of such, you realize that if you read history, you realize that the Greek people have always and will always pride in wisdom. You understand? The wiser a man is, the more he is accepted. Jewish society, I mean, Jewish society might not mind a man with wisdom, without wisdom, but with a sign. You understand? It might not mind a man without wisdom, but with a sign. So rather they see you make a lame man walk, and that's it. But when you go to the Greek, that's not it. The Greeks seek after wisdom. They are in, insight into, into, into anything that has to define a man that is mature before God. It has to be what they articulate. If a man can't speak enough wisdom. It doesn't matter how much you demonstrate by their standard. They don't seek after that. You understand what I'm saying? We are not disqualifying the ministration of demonstration. We pray for the sick, we cast out devils, we lay walk the blind, see the dead erased. Physical. Okay? Not in our mind. We've seen it with our own eyes. Do you agree? You have seen it on this group, haven't you? But there is a place where you must Reconcile these two and understand why even when the giftings and the signs are there, the wisdom is necessary. Because too much of the signs without wisdom imbalances a Christian. And too much of the wisdom without the signs disqualifies a Christian. Signs without wisdom is just imbalance. Wisdom without the signs is disqualification. You cannot continue preaching that God you can't demonstrate. At a particular point, Men disqualify you. But you can demonstrate a God you might not be able to explain. And at that point, 
men see and speak for a balance in you. But at that particular point, when you are ministering Jesus Christ, you're not ministering Jesus Christ from the point of gifting and calling upon your life, but you're ministering Christ from the point of assignment. Because divine assignment is stuck to the wisdom of God. This wisdom is held to eternity by divine purpose. And because it's eternal by divine purpose, the minister does not minister as one who has points and nuggets to write. And the teaching is wonderful. But many of you have realized that there are people who, who, who if they never make seven points and steps, they will never preach. You understand? And it's okay once in a while to have it. But there's a difference between a teacher by gift and a teacher by unction. You understand? The ministry of the unction is a place where the man gives provision for the spirit to speak even when he plans to. That man can open up his Bible to preach one thing and speak another. That man can read the Bible and seek God for a message and get to the pulpit without a message. But when he gets to the message, he starts to download. You realize that unctions are so in tune. They are so fine-tuned with men's needs. It is easier to meet a certain man's need. That is why when a man preaches from unction, you'll always see one sign of an unction minister. They always preach your question. They always preach your question. They don't create more questions. They preach your questions. Because that's the essence of the ministry of the teacher. To instruct. That is why when he's warning Timothy, he tells him of men who are ministering questions. They minister, they minister questions. The Bible tells you, rather than godly edification. It is one thing for me to preach the gospel and you go back with more questions than answers. Oh, I also have a group of people who say, I didn't understand it. Yes, even if you didn't understand it, somehow it answers. That's why you keep coming back. You understand? It might be too hard an answer, but it's an answer. It's one thing for you to have something that is not an answer, but it can be so hard and hard, yes, but it's an answer. It gets you somewhere. You mature. You understand, Randy Terry? That's why many of you, if you've been around this ministry for some time, there are those things you never understood then, but now you're starting to understand. There are those things when you came, you, you, you used to say something and say, what, what in the world? Well, then you, you looked like the other guy. You understand? From the other world. They were news. But now all over a time you realize that these things have come inside your spirit and your soul. And then I see people making the lame walk. And then they send those pictures on WhatsApp. And, and, then, and then I see a paralyzed lady the other day they sent on WhatsApp. She was paralyzed from head to toe. Guys laid hands on hands. She received life and she walked. And I'm thinking this is the gospel. This is the gospel. Why? Because it will get inside you and create another man. You understand? It will get inside your spirit and create another person. Hallelujah. 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 Now, divine assignment is the summary of a man's minister. Sorry, a man's ministry, not minister. Divine assignment is the summary of your ministry. If you're to pass in the world, either by rapture or sleeping, what will you be remembered for? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? If a man was to summarize your whole ministry, Smith Wigglesworth, apostle of faith. Jack Cole, man of restless faith. South Park, the apostle of Pentecost. You see what I'm trying to tell you? Benny Hinn, the Holy Ghost movement. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? Donald Gee, the apostle of balance. Man, this guy was deep. <laughs> he could balance you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I heard of a man who is trying to write a book to balance the grace. <laughs> I said, God. <laughs> He's writing a book to balance the grace because it seems us, we grace preachers, are preaching too much grace and he must put balance to the grace. Spirit told me he will fall. I'm serious. The Lord told me he will fall. The grace of God is not balanced. It's extreme. You can't balance it. You, listen, okay, let me make it a simpler ministry for you. You can't balance enemies. The Bible says that the law is an enemy to 
the spirit. And the spirit is an image of the flesh. And the spirit is grace. He's called the spirit of grace. If spirit of grace and, 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 and law are enemies, you're meaning you're reconciling what God tells you is irreconcilable. You're trying to reconcile what God has said is irreconcilable. You can't reconcile what the Father has said cannot be reconciled. You cannot. You're picking flowers. You're not preaching. Hallelujah. And, and let me tell you something, and I must warn this generation. When we started preaching the grace of God, of course, a lot of people took too long to understand us. Even some of you disqualified us in the beginning. Yeah? But all over the time, you kept on understanding this thing, and it worked in you. That's why you stay coming. Okay? There's even someone who has just come in now, and they even have a problem with a statement I've made. But all over a while, if they are fair as the barbarians, they'll go and search out the matters to know whether this thing says so, or they'll disqualify them and loosely believe them because they don't work in them, or they are not reasonable. Listen, the grace of God is not reasonable. I mean, she has committed adultery. Why are you acquitting her? You understand? So if we are still in the realms of reasonable ministry, we might lose the bigger picture because a man can't be in the mind of God and appeal to the minds of men. At that point, if he is in the mind of God, he can only appeal to the mind of God. You understand? That's why he says that these things are, they are so hard for some to understand. Men who are unlearned and unstable, unlearned and unstable, wrestle with like they do with other scriptures for their own destruction. Now, because of such, I have seen some of our fellow grace ministers also rise up to wage war against the legal guys, and the legal guys are also waging war against these guys. The Lord told us, that's, we can't do that. Because it would mean, one, we're on the same understanding. You understand? It would mean that we both understand the same way. Each one of us is trying to push what they want. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what you do, you just, we say, I told people, let's just stay preaching. Never seek to be better. Hallelujah. Wait for them. Even us who are legal. Some of us who are very legal. When I look at some people who are legal, I, 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 I feel sorry for them because some of us who are more legal than them. The other day someone was trying to define deliverance and casting out devils. I laughed at them. Because some of us, those things we cast, we cast out devils. We still do, by the way. We still do. If a devil annoys me, I can chase it. Okay? If it's in a person, I can sort it. We still do. You understand? But what, what was the percentage of Jesus' ministry on devils? If you read the Bible, you realize it was one third. The two thirds were ministry. But some people, it's three quarters. It's a quarter, it's a whole whole. And then the guy saw a woman on TV vomiting. And I told him, man, those things we did them when I was 19. People vomiting snakes when we were 19. We even outgrew that. Because I realized you could cast out and the thing comes back. The same person. You cast it out and they delivered. And people say, praise God, praise God. And then they go home. And then the next day they come back with eight devils. Same size. And then you go through the whole process of deliverance. And because some men benefit from that, they continue. They continue. If any man, <laughs> praise the Lord, until we teach this gospel, we will never have men truly delivered. We can hold them by our faith and cast those devils out. That's wonderful. But how do we keep them out? How do we keep them out? By the word. Tell your neighbor by the word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, in this kind of wisdom, you're finding a great society that already had its own wisdom and was established in wisdom. They were wise by any standards. They knew God their own way. You understand? They understood their own way. They worshipped their way. They had a million gods. You understand? And the most dominant idea of love in the society of the Greek was after a certain god called Eros. 
Eros is where you get the English word erotic. Okay? It's it's, it's impulsive. You understand? It's just a sexual society. They can't understand love without that one. You understand? They, they, it just can't work. You understand? It, there's just no middle ground with us. That is how the Greek understood it. They had a God for that. They had a God they worshipped. And I tell you, they used to refer that kind of God to the God of love. So you see how the Greek understood love? You see how the Greek understood love? That's how they understood love. Now when you write the Bible and you're trying to interpret it in their language, the first thought will be Eros. You understand what I'm trying to tell you? The other related words are like philia, or philo, or phileos. But the original idea of the word philia in the Greek understanding before even the gospel was brought in their context was more of one that is, is a friend to the gods. You understand? So if a man was a friend to the gods, he was, he was called philos. You understand? Friend to the gods. He is favored to the gods. Now, when they try to get Philo and Philos or Phileos to put it in the scriptures of the Bible, with their wisdom, it began differently. But they want to use a certain language to explain. If you study the root word agape, many people, the statement people use in, in, in the Greek, agape, it has the love of God. But originally, before salvation came to the Greek, that word existed without God. The word agape in the Greek existed. It was just a common term of feeling after someone. You understand? And because it, it was a common term of feeling after someone, it always looked at the dictates of what somebody has to do to give affection. It never looked at more of what the person is given as affection. That is why the first ideas of Christianity, when they formed the first Greek scholars, the Platonists, if you read their symposiums, you realize that it was more of men's love for God. And, and the more the church went there, yeah, to seeking the approvals, to seeking the pleasing, to seeking the ministration toward God. You understand? You realize that many of them lost the bigger picture. Because how, how can you love when you have not been loved enough? Where are you even defining it from? If it's about sentiments and feeling, it began from errors. By the time a child grows up, he knows that because I love this person, I have to be intimate with them this way. That's the only way I can love them. I can't love them outside that. You can't bring in the context of dying for them. Because Eros is different. It seeks a certain satisfaction. It seeks a certain gratification. It has a certain selfish interest in one or another. Why? Because because it loves, it, it seeks gratification out of the one it loves. The mind of God is not that. The mind of God is for he so loved. He so loved that he gave. It was the most painful. That is contrary to any Platonist idea. So yes, even though agape, phileo, phileos, you know, all these things, the love for a man, brotherly love, blah, 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 all of them exist in the New Testament and they are wonderful. You better understand it from the people God loved. That's why I love to define love from the Hebrew perspective, the Jewish perspective. Why? Because these are God's people. They have been with him longer than the Greek came on board. You understand? That if they try to define it in another language, you understand? They might need to borrow a certain mind to articulate. That's why I told you, agape, or agape, like it is in the Greek, existed before the Greeks knew God. It was a common term. Phileo existed before God. Philo, philia. You understand? All of those ideas existed before God. Philadelphia, you know that idea. They all existed before God. They all existed. And the idea of Philadelphia was a man feeling to love by reason of duty. All of those ideas kind of existed before God. So even though they represent 
a certain relationship of God in men, they are not the very thing because they are borrowing from the root, the real thing. If you want to understand God and love, understand God with Israel. Because this was his wife. This is his wife. We will always be his. His, his relationship is Israel. Greek get engrafted in by faith. But before even faith came, the love of God was there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me show you something. Second Chronicles chapter 1 verse 8. There's a kind of love in the Hebrew or the Greek. No, Hebrew. Yes, Jewish. It's called Hesed. H-E-S-E-D. It's Hesed. And this is a kind of deliberate choice a man makes by reason of a covenant relationship. Okay? Hesed. Covenant relationship. A man extending the favor an act of love by reason of covenant. And that sometimes has nothing to do with anything outside that covenant. It's like the law, the Ten Commandments. God didn't put the Ten Commandments as conditions for his children to have a relationship with him. Now do we realize in the New Testament that the Ten Commandments were actually to prove if we are to have a relationship between me and you, your works won't matter. That's why the Bible says, and, and, and the scriptures foresee that the Lord would justify the ungodly by faith. It spake. The Bible says, and Moses foresee the righteousness of faith. He said. Meaning that even the man that received the Ten Commandments had the understanding that righteousness can never be by works. It can only be by faith in Christ Jesus. The Ten Commandments was just the other way to show that I know if you want us to have a certain affair, there are things you think I'm expecting from you. And let me prove to you, just only do this ten. You realize you can't do the ten. Such that when we get away the ten, I, let me fulfill the ten for you. That's why the Bible says Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law. So that you get to a point where God loving you has nothing to do with what you're doing. It has everything to do with him working inside you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Listen, the place of loving God is a place of understanding the forgiveness of God. And I'll come back to that a bit. That is why the Bible says that he that is forgiven much, loveth much. He that is forgiven much, loveth much. Not he that judges, is judged much. No. Not he that is criticized much. He that is forgiven much loves more. That's the principle. Jesus, God knows very well, the children of Israel, the human heart is already desperately wicked. God, God's oldest friends, the Israelites, have proved to you, you can never love by law. You can never love because the man has acted out your expectation. Otherwise, you will never love. Even God can disappoint. In that thought. I mean, ask a Christian. How can a Christian say, God disappointed me? But a Christian do think that way. The problem is not God. The problem is their thought life. He took my mother. He... Why did that? Um, there's a girl who left church the other day and they told me, she said she might never come back to the church. I laughed. I said in the name of Jesus, she will come back. Listen, this is God hemming you in. You can run, but you can't hide. You will still come back and realize you wasted time. And the quicker you wake up, the better. Because listen, God can love you to getting you peace. He can, he can love you until you get annoyed. Are you hearing me? Until you fight. And then you wrestle and wrestle. And then you wrestle. And the more you wrestle, he loves you. Then you wrestle, then he loves you. Then you wrestle, then he changes your name. Jacob Trickster now. <laughs> Israel. Oh! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, Second Chronicles, verse 1 is, he said, in the principle, he said, he says, and Solomon said unto God, 
Huh? Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father and has made me to reign in his stead. So this is God showing mercy to David and by that reason Solomon is a benefactor. You understand what I'm saying? He's a beneficiary. Sorry. You understand? He's, he's, Solomon didn't pray. God showed mercy on David. By reason of the covenant. Do you understand? That is why I told you the other time in regards to Abraham. He says you are, you are blessed with faithful Abraham. Blessed, faithful. Blessed, faithful. He's faithful. You're blessed with faith. You're blessed because he's faithful. Abraham becomes faithful, you become blessed because he's faithful. You don't become blessed because you're faithful. No, you become blessed because he's faithful. And you become a child of, of Abraham because of faith. It's that simple. That's his faith. That is the love that gets, listen, that is the love that will get your son of drugs. One day. That is the love that will get to your daughter who sleeps around with men and stops her from doing it. Not because you fasted, not because you prayed, but he honors his servants. The Bible says he honors his servants. He says, I was once young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Neither they are seed begging bread. Your kids will not beg bread because they work the Lord. No. Your kids will not beg bread because you are the righteousness of God. And I decree that upon your life in Jesus' name. Your children will not lack tuition. Your children will not lack food. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, and your children shall I teach, and their peace shall be many. They will not be in bomb attacks. They will never be involved in car accidents. Not my child. Say, not my child. Say, not my child. He said, put you to a place of confidence in the fact that your kids will make it. Anything related to you. Listen, this anointing arrests anything associated. Anything. That's why I gave you an example. I told you, you would... When Abraham was buried, before that understanding, he told God, how be, how can it be? For I have no seed. He said, I have no seed. But Isaac didn't say, I have no seed. No, Isaac has never said, I don't. He said, my wife has no seed. He, she's barren. He can't say he has no seed. No, because... It, the father entered the scene. He, 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 he. The father entered the agreement. And on signing, Isaac was included. That's why the Bible says, he moved with the fathers of the promise. Seeking for a country. With our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and who? Jacob. In his bosom. Inside. Now Isaac can't say, I am important. No. He has entered a certain covenant. You understand? The next default. You can only be Rebecca Barry, not him anymore. Not him anymore. That's what I meant. You can't hear Isaac saying, I am barren. I don't have a seed. He had seed. Because the root word for seed is sperm. He had sperm. Praise the Lord. That one will appoint a grace on anything anointed to attached to you. It will appoint an anointing on anything attached to you. Listen, there are certain people, by reason of being attached to you, they will be blessed. Yeah. By reason of being attached to you, they will be increased. By reason of being attached to you. That the moment they cut like this back, they lose it. Some of you where you are, the moment you ever quit, some of your business, their businesses might close. Not because God wants them to close, but because you carry the pro Listen, listen. This anointing, it, it gets Jacob to a point where he, he's given the worst animals, and his animals produce very beautiful things. That the Bible tells you that the continents of Laban changed. 
he started to look at Jacob differently. She tells me, I gave you mineral water. And I drank daima juice. But how come you look like you drank <laughs> ah, ah, You understand what I'm trying to tell you? When a man understands that blessing, you don't worry if you're given little salary. You don't say, oh, this is very bad. They pay her one million, they pay him two million, and me, they pay me 500,000, and yet I do this and thing. Is that right? I don't like it. I don't, don't whine. Don't, shut up. Listen, this anointing will make you richer than the people who pay you. Oh! Some of you don't understand because you're not working. I decree and declare that you lend to your bosses in the name of Jesus. You will fit them while they're working for you. Listen, this thing is bigger than any man. I've seen it. It works. Oh, I'm in family. They don't like me. I'm a stepdaughter. They give them food. They give them shoes. They give them DVD players. But me, they don't give me DVD players. Even for breakfast, they give them bread, I mean bread, and, 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 and beans and eggs. And then me, they give me water. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Who is healthier? When a man understands that, you don't complain how much they pay you. Many years ago I told God, hey, my God, now they give me something that is not worth me. Do you know what God told me? He told me, pay yourself. I told him, sorry? He told me, pay yourself. I told him, how can that be? Well, he told me grace. Do, listen, he told me, think about it. You do this, and then they get you from one desk and add you an extra million. Then they get you from another desk, and then they put you from an extra, extra million. So you earn an extra two or three million because you've gotten from one desk to another. Is that the principle to grow? I told him that's what I know in the world. He told me yes, but that's not me. When the Bible, listen, some people have never thought it. When the Bible says promotions come from neither east nor west. Let me then add, not even your boss. Promotions come from God. The moment I read it. I don't admire being CEO. Those are titles. I don't. MD. I don't admire. I don't admire. My, my aspirations change to pay myself. <laughs> Tell somebody I pay myself. I pay myself. And I work for divine purpose. Not money. Our family is rich. You get it? <laughs> That's why in Proverbs it says, never labor to be rich. Never. Don't. Please. Don't. That's why when I go to those seminars where people say, you do this and do this and this, and then when you do this, and then you do that, and then you invest here, and then you invest there, then... You will be rich. I just walk out. Because I realized they were talking to poor people. And I ain't among them. <laughs> teach a rich man to make more wealth. But please don't teach a poor man and expect me to be there. I'm not poor. I refuse it. I refuse it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when you hear conferences of how to get from poverty to don't go. But when you hear how to increase your wealth, go. <laughs> go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because that's the mind. That's the mind. Hallelujah. That's why I told you that this kind of grace passes on a blessing on anything that comes after you. That is the only guarantee that it doesn't matter how wasted the next generations will be. My kids will not be wasted. I know that. I know that. You understand? We might not be there for our children by reason of every time, I mean. By reason of the mandate that is upon our lives. 
We're kingdom people. You know, we worked for the kingdom, we married for the kingdom, we produced for the kingdom. You understand? It had nothing to do with feelings. Even the feelings die. You understand? If Samuel's mother, listen, if Samuel's mother had enough wisdom to get the boy after winning, and then he takes him to Ella and tells him, boys, I love you. I want to play with you, bubble gum and tingles, but you're a minister of the gospel. Go. You yours are sent to boarding. It's metallic suitcases. But by the time old covenant promise I mean an old covenant woman goes on her knees and tells God if you give me a child I shall give him to you listen by the time he says if you give me a child I shall give him to you New Testament dispensation must have better wisdom day one when my kid is born you are a minister of the gospel First year, you are a minister of the gospel. Two years, you are a minister of the gospel. Five. What you want to be, darling? Dad, I saw a woman, and she's a pilot. Yes. You will be a pilot in your dad's ministry. <laughs> we have enough this side. You don't get this. We have enough this side. You don't need to go in the world for a man to, to hire you according to, to the ratings of government. I'm telling you, watch our lives. You find a professor, he's working in a university, you tell him, how much can I pay you to teach children on Sunday school? Because I see an anointing on you to teach young people. And he says, I earn six million. I tell him, I'll pay you seven. Come and work. Teach young kids. University professor. He gets children now. Mary had a little... <laughs> Finally, people will get to do what they love to do. The best chef is doing an engineering course. Because your African parent told you you're too poor. You'll never make it. You're burning your head with mathematics. It's even killing you. Go and cook. Fashion, the best fashion designers right now are studying Napoleon Bonaparte. Go and follow your dream. Make clothes. Why? Because the divine principle of providence is simple. Anything you turn to will provide. Anything. 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 Come back. Anything. Hallelujah. If you're a hairdresser, you'll dress ministry ladies. We will pay you. Mention your price. Jesus mentioned. And say, me, I want to be paid this much. I'll tell you why. There are chefs who earn more than the highest paid man in Uganda in the government. And they're chefs. Why is that principle working on them? Why isn't it working on you? You compete over courses up to a point where you do the, what you think is the best course. And now you've done it for four or three years and you're saying, oh God, why did I enter tourism? <laughs> you, you imagine you're going to be taking guests. That is the chimpanzee. Listen. Listen. Listen, do it because God has called you to. Not because you need a salary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do it because God has told you your ministry is tourism. Listen, when a man studies for the kingdom, 
He becomes a kingdom engineer. Not an engineer in the kingdom. You understand? When he studies to do medicine, he becomes a medical, kingdom medical person. Not a, a kingdom with a medical person. One is bigger than the other. And God is bigger than all. That is why he made it simpler for you. Our profession is Christ. Paul said it. He says, for our profession is Christ. Career guidance. Really? What have I told you? You've gone for career guidance lessons all of your life. What have you learned? A guy just puts on a very nice suit, but his, woman, his marriage is failing and he tells you I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer by profession. It's very good to do law. I make this much every day. One time we went to a, with a bunch of, of people. They were, uh, hey, let me even not go there. There were some bankers one time, they went to visit a school. One of the highest offices in the bank was there as well. Banking is good. You're inspiring young kids to be bankers. Some of the bankers, yeah, we're speaking, we're speaking, we're speaking. And we bankers know how to boast. Man, I'm a bunker. You know what I'm I'm a bunker. <laughs> so, this big managing director finished his speech. And then, he said, any questions? You know what he said? managed. And the kid raised up his hand and asked him, P3, what is the buying rate of the dollar on the market? <laughs> uh, darling, I, I can ask, I can check my Blackberry and see on mails whether I can get that. Why did you ask? God told him, because I know it, I just wanted to confirm whether you know it. <laughs> Ooh, hallelujah. You'll never know it all outside the world, but you can know it all in God. You can know it all in God. Hallelujah. When the blessing rests on you, you do your passion. You do your passion. And you do it for the kingdom. In the kingdom. Imagine if we are able to, to pay our own people the amount of money they want. People will apply to work for us. Conditions. Are you born again? Okay. Do you threaten to be born again? Okay. Can you listen? If you can, we can hire you. Because any man who listens has no choice. They can get born again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. Look at people who are raised in royal families. I mean rich royal families. Realize many of them don't really craft out to be good professionals. And when we speak, they are. They do it for passion. You, you're, you're a child of the most high God. Not the Queen of England. You're the child of a most high God. Harry can't think, let me study hard. Because if I don't study, <laughs> if Harry can't think, you, how much you? How, how much more you? That's why some people, sh you, should, you should understand the source of happiness. And true happiness. True happiness is doing what you want to do. Don't worry, you can't think wrong. You have an unction. It's an anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the testimony of said puts you in a place where there are certain things that will never happen to anything attached to you. Why? Because God is in covenant with it. It's a relationship that he must honor because he is faithful even when we're not faithful. Hallelujah. If this thing sinks in your head, You'll never worry about your house, your children, your wife, your husband. The other day I was counseling a woman. She told me, I want to marry a pastor. But people, guys these days are. 
So, we don't know who the right ones are. In my head I said, this one is not our church member. I understood. I just went to the scriptures to explain. Listen, you can never get a wrong guy. By reason of that promise. But I have said, listen, you will never land in the wrong guy. Those things of, you might marry and then the man says, yours will not. I swear you won't. He will not. Listen, yours will not. Because of the blessing. Because of the blessing. Even if both of you are sickle cell carriers, your child will not carry sickle cell. Because he said, their peace shall be many. Don't even waste your time going to doctors for that nonsense. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your kids will not be invalid. They will not. There will not be cabbages. Yours will not. You will not produce a lame child. You will not. If they are lame, we pray for them and they walk. With God all things are possible. I say with God all things are possible. Somebody say I have a divine covenant that everything and anybody attached to me shall be blessed. Hallelujah. 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 This is God deliberately to love you. Praise the Lord. I wanted to show you something else. Psalms 103, verse 13. One o three verse thirteen. He says, "Look at this. Like a father pities his children. Like a father pities his children. Like a father pities his children." And I intended to read only from the Old Testament. Like a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear Him. Give me the message version of that. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 13. 13. As parents feel for their children, God feels for those who. That's when now the 14 comes in. And it says, He knows us inside and out. He keeps in mind that we're made of mind. Now, the new creature must understand he's referring to the weakness of your flesh. Your spirit is perfect. It's incorruptible. That which is born of God does not, cannot commit sin, for his seed remains in him. Okay? So he's not talking about the spiritual you. He's talking about your flesh. He even has compassion for your flesh. When he's going to smite your flesh, he remembers your mind. Not mad, M.A.D. <laughs> Not mad. Advertisement. But mad, M.U.D. Praise the Lord Jesus. Now, this language here is the Hebrew word Raham. R-A-H-A-M. It's another kind of love. Raham is brotherly love. It is what relates you by the Spirit. It's what relates you by the spirit. Pure spirit. Why? Because you're all spirit. You understand? You're all spirit. It's what, it's what relates you by the spirit. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. Brotherly love. In fact, the Hebrew word there, Raham, is directly translated as from the same womb. From the same womb. When a man understands that this is my brother, physically, okay? Like some of you who have had people who are raised with you in the same family, and by reason you know that you, you let me use direct translation, drank on the same breast. Huh? There are things you can't do your blood brother. Why? Because you're from the same womb. It can be funny. You understand? 
One time when I was young, I went out and started the fight. Okay? There was this neighborhood guy called Sudi. I used to love, I used to love punching a lot. Not, not, not planned punches. No, me, I loved you. Throw me inside the fight. Just don't do cross lines. What? Uh -uh. Throw me in the fight. We start. I never knew this was of touch me, you push, why? Uh uh. I loved the fight. I just loved it. You understand? So I get this guy. It's called Sudi. We used to have rings. They put rings of sticks, you step, put one stick here, the other one here, then you tie lines like your are ring. But if they punch you a good one, you can break it. It's like, was that weak, okay? Because I'm made out of cassava sticks. That's them. Yes, yeah, some of you are 2.com. You don't even know how cassava is grown. <laughs> you were born in 19 what? 90, 80. It's still young. So, we enter the ring. Okay? I enter. First round. Ding, ding. <laughs> Stop fighting. I hit him. Bam! He falls down. Yeah! I go like the other side. Emphasize a man. Grace, you're good. I say, hmm. So, we're supposed to be going for what? Second round. Come second round. Stand. <laughs> So they punched me. <laughs> I just remember seeing a man in action like. <laughs> and <I> so. <laughs> and during that time, I was not really bad days with my brother. We had our own differences. But when he had that they had beat Grace, that guy with glasses, he's wild. He can fight for a whole week. Who could fight? <laughs> Pastor Ronald Mutunji Kutesa could fight for a whole week. He came and asked, who beat him? They told him, Sudi. <laughs> he says, Sudi, up to inside their home. <laughs> and beat him in their own living room. <laughs> My brother. After messing Sudi up, he came back home. We're not tight, but they beat you. You see, I don't like him now, but they beat you. You understand? Listen, that is the thing that even keeps marriage. You see people who live together, they quarrel, but they never leave. <laughs> Attack his wife, he will kill you. But here, they are exchanging fire. <laughs> but you come in, you come in their mix. Get their beef and try to eat a bit. They will make you stake yourself. <laughs> that was me and my brother. And then in the evening, afternoon, they will tell us, don't move, don't go out of the gate. Move to my gate. You, Maureen is here, she knows. Your time when mommy is sleeping, you pass this other side of the house. There's a way you open the gate. They don't even hear you. <laughs> and me, I would wait when he's stepping out. <laughs> and when I see he's stepping out, I'm saying, wake up. Even me, I start to fall. And then as he's going, he sees me and says, don't follow me, don't follow me. He goes. I follow him. One time he even threw stones at me. <laughs> it was that serious. We, 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 we have beef, but we love each other. If you want to understand, let an enemy come in. We would quarrel and quarrel, but when we get to a point where somebody touches me, you realize he loves me. Now the Bible says, like a parent feels after her children. Good example was well, Pastor Zach was driving back after a church service. And there was this man who was holding a baby for, the, for a certain lady. And they were walking just around 
we are gay. Eh? Isn't it? Chileka. No, we are gay. So fly over. And then as they're walking, a certain car comes recklessly. Eh? Hits the woman. There was a very big ditch there. She falls in and her leg twists. Eh? And then it continues. And then hits a certain man who was holding the kid. You understand? The haki. So the next thing we know is, we also see the man falling in the ditch. And this woman's leg almost disfigured. You understand? But the moment the car hit them, like, blam! And it spread off. When she came to her senses, she said, oh, wana wange. You understand? My kid. You understand? She didn't care whether her leg is broken. Happy she was, my kid. You understand? She didn't care whether her leg was bruised. Her business was simple. My kid. Then she dragged herself. My kids, you understand? For her, her business, she doesn't care whether she dies or not. Her business is simple. My kids. I remember even one time when I used to work in KCC. I told her, I used to work, you know, pre-test, post-test counseling, you know, pre prevention of marriage, child transmission, reproductive health, etc. And then, <laughs> listen, I told a certain woman, If, you, if we check you and we find your child positive, what will you do? She said one thing. My kid. You get it? Her business was not whether she has or she doesn't. My kids. Because by reason of reproducing after their own kind, they got an attachment that doesn't make anything in their life important except for their kids. You understand? That parent can take the life of their own child. Now, these are earthly people. How much more your heavenly father? Do you think that when your heavenly father sees you afflicted by disease, he says, I told her to just stop sleeping around. See, she got HIV. She deserves it. Huh, yeah, let her get it. I told her. I told her. My kid. My kid. Why they preach? This man preach, oh, let him die. He, he was very promiscuous. Listen. Your father is my kid. The Bible says, passionate to the Lord is the death of his saints. He feels like exploding when you die. He, listen, if, if, if some of you can't even live without your mothers, how much more your heavenly father? Who is, the, who is love? He doesn't even love. He is love. Do you understand, Brother Terry? Now, the ministry of Abraham, is what teaches you to understand that everybody that is in the gospel is your brother. Listen, she stole, she abused, she, ab she annoyed you, but she's still your sister. She's your blood from the same womb. Your Jerusalem is the mother for us all. She is the mother of us all. And our father is one. Jehovah God. When a man understands that wisdom, listen, you can't you can't fight. You can't even see a sister being beaten. And because she annoyed you, you feel she deserves it. You are from another mother. And definitely another father. Listen. We can have even differences in the body of Christ. But if we ever get to a point where we can't even greet each other. And then you... you a church member greets you and because they annoyed you last week, you can't answer. You don't know which womb you come from. You don't know which womb you come from. That, listen, that's what draws balances in what we do to other Christians. You understand? I wronged my father. I, I, sorry, I wronged my father. But I've seen his son. Have you been expelled in school? And he got pissed, punched me almost one day to kill me. But I was still his boy. Next morning he says, go to school. He gives me tuition. He's my father. An athlete father. Now, if you athlete fathers know how, not what to give, but how to, how much more your heavenly father? Why are we living in a form of Christianity like there are men who don't understand what's from the same womb? You can't take your own brother to court. You can't. You can't. Lost a lot of money lending to Christians, but we never took them to police. We would rather lose all that money than taking fellow Christians to police. 
It's another thing. He's your brother. Oh, of course if it's a Hussein, I take him to court. Right? <laughs> That's why the Bible says, be good. More so to the household of faith. More so to the household of faith. More so to the household of faith. But in our own church, in this body of Christ, have I seen men who get their own brother and take him to courts and say, he's gay, he's, he's sodomizing little boys. He's your brother. Talk to him, he's your brother. If, the, if systems, symptoms persist, seek Papa God's advice. Take him to God. If you want to understand the ministry of religion, look at a spiritual man who takes an issue to the state. State is not spiritual. They can't judge spiritual matters. For them, they will handle crime, not sin. Church handles sin. That now takes you to the deepest ministry of the love of God. What the Greek called agape, in the, in the Hebrew it's called ahab. Ahab. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 24. Ahab. Ahab. Okay. And David comforted but said by his wife. Listen. And David comforted but said by his wife. If you know the story of Bathsheba, Bathsheba was the wife to Uriah. David killed Uriah and took over Bathsheba's wife. You understand? And when he killed Uriah and took over Bathsheba's wife, the religious mind is simple. He, firstly, the woman must be a prostitute also. Why did she give it? You understand? She would have refused. Or she would have fled. But she kept on, Bathsheba kept on going. There's a problem with Bathsheba. You understand? There was a problem with Bathsheba. But he says in the story, David killed Uriah. He was even judged by God. You understand? And now the offspring of that was supposed to be unholy seed. I know of a ministry myself where if you produce a child out of wedlock, they can't dedicate that child. I know churches like that. I know churches that if you got pregnant before marriage, they can't allow to bring that child in front of God because they call them bastard children. Malachi, they quote Malachi, unholy seed. But they forget that if you go back to the scriptures, Pastor Isaiah read, you realize the scriptures say, and the holy husband sanctifieth the wife. And the wife sanctifieth the husband. The next line many people have not read is, and so if you watch, the Bible says, for how well shall they have holy seed? He says, in this instance, their children shall be holy. The moment a woman believes, to salvation, even if both of them are Muslims, since I'm born again, children become automatically holy. That that curse of having produced a bastard child is out of order. That's why if your mother is not born again, preach the gospel to her for the sake of your brethren who are not born again. Hallelujah. Elsewhere, your children are clean, but now are they holy? Now, let me take you back to, 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 to someone. Let me show you the mystery of Ahab, just deeper than Raham. He says, And David comforted Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her, and she bore a son. And I'm thinking, God is going to say, I reject him. But the Bible says, And he called his name Solomon, I'm the Lord. Give me the message version. That's what I wanted. David went and comforted his wife Bathsheba, and when he slept with her, they conceived a son. When he was born, they named him Solomon. God had special love. They were born out of wedlock, but God had special love. He had special love. That is the ministry of Ahab. Ahab is defined as the unconditional love. That love that is spontaneously overflowing. Spontaneously overflowing. That's what the Greek man can define as agape. But agape is more common than Ahab. Because Ahab is not subject on what you do. Ahab is the man in the sea. Are you hearing me? But God still loves him. 
overflowingly and spontaneously. Are there people in your life you realize you can never hate, even when you try, you love them? There are people, I'll tell you, there are people you, you should be hating. There's a woman I know, I wondered why she married a certain man. I wondered why she married a certain man. And she told me going to Gala. She's the one I love. She's funny, yes, but she's the one I You get it? Now, if human beings can do that, this guy would go bring sleep around, and I'll tell you the truth. She almost died because of him. You understand? But she loved him. You can say, I said, now if human beings can do this, how much more the heavenly father? Now you see the mind of God. The religious man now would be daddy, your pagan child. Take out your pagan child. But the Bible says God had a special love for Solomon. Even in this guy's witness, he still had a special love. That is the kind of love that overlooks sin. Can I show you one of the most, the strongest verses I've ever seen in the Bible? Isaiah 43 verse 25. It's one of the strongest statements I've ever read. He says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thine transgressions for my own sake. And will not remember your sin. Listen, this is by the time Jesus forgives me for his sake. By the time he gets to a point and he says, I'll have mercy on you. Not because you're a good guy, not because you work hard, not because you do the right thing, but because my own sake. I love you. And mine overflows spontaneous. It's unconditional. So we know without your sin. Let me do it for my own sake. Why? Because I need you. More than you need me. And it means that I'm going to make peace with you and then we will walk together just by reason of forgiving you. Let me forgive you for my own sake. It's as though God is saying. He, it's as though he, he breaks and says, me, I love you. Even if you get to a point when you don't love me and, and we have to get to a point of you annoying me to a point where I do not want to talk to you, I will still love you for my sake. Why? Because I need to love you. God doesn't even love you. He needs to love you. Because it's love. He needs to be God. That is why I'm alive. That is why you are alive. Listen, we would be so dead. Imagine if God never forgave us. See, the Bible tells us he has not dealt with us as he should. He has, he has the ability. He has the records. But he chooses to say, okay, not only will I forgive for my own sake, let me choose not to remember. I want to walk with you in a relationship that is as though you have never annoyed me. Yeah, you piss me off and that's okay. I want to act like we have never had anything, any of this crap that is separating you and me. Why? For my sake. For my sake. That is the strongest statement I have ever read in the Bible. He's not helping me. Yet I know he's helping me. Do you understand? But he chooses not to help me. He chooses to help himself. And say, so, you know what? I know that you're funny. And I, it's, already, it's already enough to break you. When you think back of how many things I've, I've let off the hook for your sake and said, well, let's, let's just bury this. I saw this. I saw it happen. You even got the t-shirt about it. You have your history. It's too ugly to look at, but I can make you clean. Let's just act that you have a new history. That is why I realized you can never love with a person. My father showed it. You, listen, you can't, if, if you're going to love people, 
Forget their past. Forget it. Forget it. However ugly it is, forget it. Let me show you something. Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Hallelujah. Hosea. The word of the Lord that came unto Hosea, the son of Barry, in the days of Uzziah, Joseph, and Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah, and in the days of Jerome, the son of Josh, king of Israel. Next line. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said unto Hosea. This is what the Lord said unto me. God take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. He didn't tell her, go get a virgin girl. Look for a woman from a family who comes from a very good family. Has never had a man, never done anything, never gone anywhere. Good girl, lights bubble gum and ice cream and chocolate. Straight girl, reverend's daughter, pastor's kid, righteous from head to toe. Never shed blood. God tells Hosea, God take unto thee a wife of hosts. Now, the difference between wife and woman is this. Wife is created by God to marry a man. That's what the Bible says. He that leaves, the Bible says that for this reason a man shall leave his own house and go be joined with his wife, not woman. Men don't marry women. They marry wives. And it's a process from a woman to a wife. There's a process there. There are things women can't do and wives can do. There are things wives can't do and women can do. Listen, I'll give you an example. If Pastor Isaiah's wife, Mrs. Deborah Ambuga, was only a woman, me and Pastor Isaiah would have separated five years ago. If she was a woman, me and Pastor Isaiah would have separated five years ago. Because I know how many times I even got into her time as a wife to be Pastor Isaiah. And she would sit in the coach and wait for him to come back at two in the morning. Who was he with grace already? Doing what? Preaching the gospel. Of course they judged him. How can he leave his wife? I know. It was painful. Because he used to come in the car. Man, I have my cheek. I have to have. It's killing me, man. It's killing me. I told him, yeah, I understand, even me. About this. He's my witness. But, listen, but, but, listen, listen. Listen. But he always kept on saying, how shall they believe unless they're preached to? We were pioneering something and we're still working on that. We had to pay certain price. Because the grace gospel was not easy those days. It wasn't. It wasn't. We preached the whole night. The whole night. And then he goes back with red eyes. And then he leaves the next day. And these kids don't have an opportunity to see him. You understand what I'm saying? If that woman was just a woman, she would have created a certain place to separate us. She's a wife. You understand? Now, God tells Hosea, He didn't tell him, Go to the holes and get a woman, I'll make her a wife. No. He tells her, Go to the holes, there's a wife. The, she's a prostitute. But my mind tells me she's a wife. I wish you understand. He didn't tell him, go and get a home and marry her. I shall make her a wife. No, he told her, go get a wife from the hose. That means there are hoes who are wives. And there are straight women who are not. 
And the man marries a whore and you're like, why in the world did he marry a whore? She's a wife. Listen. Goma, the wife of Hosea, could have only gotten married by grace. Yeah. There are certain people, you don't understand what I'm saying. There are certain people here, your story is too ugly to be married. It can only take Jehovah God to call you husband or wife. Go take yourself a wife, Halachi, and have children of Halachi. He names all the three kids. Go, my wife produced three kids, all of them with names. And representation spiritually. After Goma finished three kids, she went back into her whoring business. And I thought at that time Hosea was going to seek for divorce. Like I see some people. Listen, grace preachers, if you have understood that grace, you can't divorce. I mean, I just realized this. If you understand grace, you can't. Because God hates it. He knows it can happen, but he hates it. She goes whoring again to other men. And there is imagining. What is she up to? Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet. Love a woman beloved of her friend. Yet another adultery, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel. Who look to other gods? And love flagons of wine. Next slide. So I bought her to me 15 pieces of silver. To one omar of Bali. And half omar of Bali. Next slide. And I, shall, and, I, and, I, and I said unto her. Thou shalt abide for me many days. And thou shalt not play the harlot. And thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Next slide. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without the king. Blah, 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 blah. But what I wanted to show you was simple. He she was even willing to know that if, if this woman's issue is money, yeah? and that's the only way I will love her, he got money and got on the line to buy his wife again. I mean, if, if Harlot is money and it takes money to get you back, And so the Bible says that he that never spared his own son. As in, your case, your case was so serious that you needed Christ. As in, there was, there was nothing that could buy you back. That was the price the devil put on you. And he said that if the price is Christ, he didn't withhold his own. He sent him. He sent him. Then he died for you. Then you go back in Hallowtree again. He comes. Buys you back. For his own sake. He loves you. It's not too much to ask when God tells you to forgive your sister. It's not too much to ask. He has forgiven you more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why 1 Corinthians 14 chapter 1 says, this is, let us make it our greatest quest. Follow up the charity. Give me the amplified. Seek, eagerly pursue and seek to acquire this earth. And make it your aim. Your great quest. This is the biggest commandment for any minister of the gospel. This is the only thing I see God tell you to eagerly pursue in capital letters. And seek to acquire. Now this is not you loving men. Because you can't by advice and command. 
you can only do it by understanding the love of God. That's why when Paul, Peter, the apostles entered into the gospel, they realized that the mystery now was God loving men. Religal people have shifted the love of God toward men. You understand? Well, they can't show how much God loves men, but they can show how much men should love God. And how many men before have loved God and gotten results. Does it frustrate it? He says, this is God loving you enough to love. Make this love your own, meaning it's available. You make it your own. The Greek didn't know that love. That's why the, the, the closest word to love in the Greek then was charity. That's why Tyndall translated as charity. He couldn't define love in it. And he was killed because he didn't translate something the way they wanted them. He was trying to prove that Greeks don't know love. Jewish people are forgiven much, no love. That's why John says that I am the, the he always referred to himself. It's like, I read it somewhere. I think it's something called John chapter 20, verse 2, where he says that he's the disciple Jesus loved. This is John writing. Do you realize he says the disciple? And, and she ran it and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. But this John. And he is the guy writing. That means John never took time to boast of how much he loved. He took time to boast of how much he was loved. That's why James 2.8 says, it's the royal law. It's what makes us royalty. It's what makes you out of the world. It's what makes you a child of God. It's what makes you born from above. Listen, if a man has not forgiven his own enemies, if you're not shaking hands with anybody, you're not royalty. You came from another place. You came from another place. Praise the Lord. You came from another place. This is not what you do to attain the love of God. This is what he has done. Bask into it. It will work in you. John 15 verse 9. Let's read, let me read this one. As the Father has loved me. You see, Jesus first received it. He first received it. So have I loved you. Continue in my love. As in, take it on from there. Understand, Father loved me, I love you. You love them because I love you and Father loves me. Give me the message version of that. See how the message puts it. I've loved you the way my Father has loved me. He says, make yourselves at home. 